Hey! Fantastic. Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? Thank you very much. Oh, good. Excellent. Pleased to hear it. Um, <laughs> it's a bit early, isn't it? A bit early for this. Right. Uh, my name's Graham. Uh, I've been working in computer security for about 30 years. As Gordon told you, I, I started off way back when in the dawn of time, uh, right, working for Dr. Solomons. Um, in fact, I think I was programmer number two or three uh, at the time, Alan Solomon, who really does exist. Alan Solomon. Uh, he's not like uh, John McAfee, who doesn't exist. That's, <laughs> that's surely a figment of someone's crazy imagination. Um, no, Alan Solomon really does exist. And uh, he was doing all the work on the DOS version of Dr. Solomon's antivirus toolkit. And this thing called Windows 3.0 was coming out. And uh, he got me in and he said, hey, Graham, you should, or, or, I want you to write the Windows version. I said, you do understand, Alan that I've never written a Windows program before. He said, not a problem, he says. No one's going to buy it. <laughs> Everyone's going to buy the OS2 version, he said, which was the version which he was writing. So I had to write the Windows version with the pretty buttons and things like that. And uh, turned out it was wrong. So it's very hard to make predictions about the future and what's going to be successful. It's a bit like Betamax versus VHS. In fact, in fact, I'm talking about VHS. Videotape has already aged me amongst half of the audience here. Going, what on earth are you talking about there? Um, so, yeah, so I've been working for a long time for both uh, Dr. Solomons and I worked for Sophos for a while. Last six years or so, I've been working for myself, doing talks, doing podcasts, writing, blogging, generally uh, being a bit of a loud mouth uh, about the subject of computer security and hopefully raising awareness and, as well. And if any of you do happen, plug, 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 uh, to listen to my podcast, come and grab me in a break and I might have a smashing security sticker for you. But do not dare, do not dare to try and claim your sticker if you don't listen to the podcast. Because I will ask you a very, very technical, cryptic question which only true listeners will know the answer to. Ah, oh, he's just answered it, yes. <laughs> Does it have a G or not? Okay, um, so let's begin. My talk today is entitled Not All Cyber Criminals Are Evil Geniuses. And I hope by the end of this presentation, you will agree with me. But I think it's important, first of all, to understand, well, where are, where's the public getting its perception of cybercrime and, and who the bad guys actually are? Um, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at one example. Does anyone remember these guys? Lulsec. <sighs> yes. A notorious hacking gang who were not only quite successful at breaking into organizations and stealing data and embarrassing them or launching denial of service attacks, but were also really good at public relations. They had a very active Twitter account, if you remember. And to be honest, uh, the guy who was running the Twitter account was pretty funny. <laughs> and, and, and you would follow it. And many, many people were following, not only for the latest stories of which organizations they'd hacked, but simply because, although they were doing very naughty things, they were also quite amusing. But one day, we woke up to the news in June 2011 that one of the hackers had been caught. And according to the British media, what have we got here? World's number one hacker. Suspect is Essex boy. Essex teenager linked to wave of global hacking. Um, police swoop on teen cyber mastermind, etc., uh, etc. Et and this is the, the kind of thing which we were seeing. Um, so an arrest was made after the spate of attacks which were coming from Lulsec. This is the independent report. Uh, again, saying that we've actually got a picture of his house. And uh, we saw the Daily Mail report as well. And one of the things that the Daily Mail love to do is they love to tell you how... They love to give you details of the house. Because with the Daily Mail, it's not only, you know, royals or a celebrity cellulite or something like that. They also want to keep you up to date on house prices around the country. And so they will give you not only an estimate as to how much the house is worth and whether it's detached or semi-detached, but they'll also, if they manage to, they'll, they will also print pictures of inside the house and the hacker's den. And let's take a look inside the teenager's bedroom. This is his actual bedroom right here. Now, you can tell instantly he's a hacker 
because he has two computer monitors. What kind of twisted evil brain would be able to cope with two monitors? Certainly not me. And this is where he's alleged to have masterminded his cybercrime attacks. And all on the wall above the monitors, you can't see it terribly clearly here, but there are picture, there's a picture of two scantily clad women uh, with their bottoms in the air. Uh, on, on the poster up there above his monitor. Again, what kind of weird, twisted, perverted mind uh, is going on here? But you can also tell that this is a teenage hacker's, a teenage hacker's room, because look at this. He has actually, for some reason, covered his window with tin foil, and he has some sort of air conditioning unit. And any of you who have teenage children, particularly teenage boys, will understand the need to recycle the air in that room as regularly as possible, particularly if someone is the kind of person who would spend a lot of time in their bedroom, maybe with two monitors and a, a big painting of two ladies with their bottoms in the air. So... The question which the Daily Mail wanted answered was this. What does he look like? An exclusive, said the Daily Mail. We have the face of the teenage cyber terrorist. Who would like to see a picture of this twisted individual? Anybody? Yes, Graham. Yes, Graham. Yes, Graham. I know it's a bit early. Here he is. This is the picture of 19-year-old, according to the Daily Mail, Ryan Clear. Now, clearly... Um, this actually isn't a picture of him at 19, but they managed to get his school photograph. So they grabbed a picture of him at 13, and they put that on the front of the Daily Mail newspaper. And there it was amongst all the other headlines. And some of the newspapers really went over the top in the attacks. If you think I've been bad slagging him off so far, um, some of the newspapers really went over the top, including the Sun newspaper, who described him as a nerdy, geeky, reclusive oddball. Um, which frankly describes two-thirds of us in this room, let's be honest. Let's take a long, hard look at ourselves. You know, we'd probably tick off quite a few things there, I think, ourselves. Now, this didn't go down terribly well, surprise, surprise, with the hacking community, and Lulsec decided to get its revenge. And what they did was this. If you went to the Sun website after this report was published, just like a day later, you saw this. You saw a news story that media mogul's body discovered and that Rupert Murdoch had tripped over some topiary in his garden, cracked his head open, possibly inhaled some polonium and died. What the hackers had done is they'd not actually defaced the Sun's website. They'd not managed to hack into the Sun website itself and change the stories up there. But they had managed to alter and meddle the Sun website's DNS records, which meant that you were now being taken to a completely different website when you typed in thesun.co.uk and you were able to see this fake story instead. And that's the kind of manipulation which hackers can often do. I remember that they, they, oh, clearly they're not the only organization which has been hit by DNS hijacking like this. I remember this once happened to Twitter. And if you went to twitter.com, you didn't go to the real twitter.com. You actually end up on a defaced website which had a political message on it uh, as well from a Middle Eastern group. And the media's instant reaction is, oh my goodness, they've been hacked. Well, they, 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 part of them has been hacked or their DNS registrar has been hacked, but the website itself hasn't been compromised. It's just that you're now going to something else entirely. But this is where you're getting redirected if you wanted headline news, and that was the harm of maybe describing people as nerdy, geeky, reclusive oddballs. But sure enough, Ryan Cleary, which was his name, was arrested, and he did see court. Here is a picture of him as a 19-year-old when he was actually ultimately sentenced. But it got me thinking. It got me thinking, you know, the media often will present these people as being, you know, nerdy, we'll sometimes say hacking mastermind. We were told he was the number one hacking suspect in the world. I don't think so. I think that may have been something of a hyperbole. But why don't we get scientific about this? Why don't we try and understand, well, who's in the evil camp and what evil means and who's in the genius camp and who's an evil genius in the middle as well? And if we can work that out, maybe we'll be some way to better understand what these hackers, these malicious hackers at least, are really like. So I'm going to put up, let's play a game. I'm going to put up a series of pictures of people and you can tell me whether you think they're evil or geniuses or both. Okay? Could be interesting, right? 
Let us begin. Is everyone ready? Do we need a theme tune? Dun 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 Right. Does everyone know this chap? I mean, not personally, hopefully. Hopefully you haven't got posters of him up in your rooms or anything like that. It is, of course, Adolf Hitler. And he is... Very good. It's always good to start a conference like this to work out who the neo-Nazis might be in the room. <laughs> and we found out that we haven't got very many here today. So he goes into the Venn diagram over on this side. And now let's have another chap. All right, here's a chap. Anyone know who this is? Right. Einstein, absolutely. Now, if we were using machine learning, we might determine that he's evil because he has a moustache. Turns out, not everyone with a moustache is in fact evil. For instance, Tom Selleck, right? Magnum PI, not a bad guy, right? Lionel Richie in his heyday had a moustache. Don't think he does anymore. Maybe he does have it. I don't know. Anyway, not a bad guy, Lionel Richie. See, so don't put people like that into the evil camp. So we have to have something, some other way of determining who's evil, who's actually a genius. Here's another one. Stalin. Well, I've got very, 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 very bright, very bright group here. Yes, and I would argue that he is evil. Absolutely. I'm glad no one's saying evil genius so far. Like, yeah, he was evil, but wasn't it brilliant? <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. We're not going there. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's mess it up a bit. Let's make it a little bit more complicated, right? Because you're getting a bit cocky about how easy this is. Right. Here's our next. We're going to give you two people or organisms. What about this? Who's, who's the chap on the left? What do you think? Not Doctor Who, no. Goodness, I can't. He's got an apple. Yes, someone said it. Newton. It's Isaac Newton. There's his apple in iconic format, uh, falling beside him. I'm afraid I couldn't find a photograph of Isaac Newton. That's why I'm, <laughs> if you're wondering about this. And of course, the Daleks. Any opinions? What about Isaac Newton? Genius. Genius. I agree. Daleks, bad guys. Not good at all. Another one. Who are we thinking about here? That's not Davros, that's, that's Stephen Hawking, and that's meant to represent Da Vinci, okay? So again, right? Both geniuses, right? In their own way. All right, you think this is a simple game, Graham? Thank you for introducing us to this game. I don't think we're going to be playing at our Christmas party. Well, let me make it a bit more complicated. Let's bring on the big guns. <laughs> right? Who have we got here? Clippy. What's your opinion? Yeah. Damn right. <laughs> Phil Collins. Genius. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a problem with PowerPoint. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there we go. All right, well, we're getting quite good at this. Let's take a look at some other examples. This guy's Albert Gonzalez. And Al Gonzalez made a name for himself some years ago because he was running a hacking game. He was the mastermind uh, of the group which hacked uh, TJ Maxx, or sometimes called TK Maxx. They stole 40 million credit card details and then a further 130 million credit card details from Heartland Payment Systems. And one of the ways in which they were able to do that is that the, uh, TK Maxx and Heartland were using as their wireless protocol WEP. Right, which as we all know is super, super easy to crack, easy to intercept and get the information. So they were using an old, outdated, cracked wireless protocol and so the hacker was able to steal the information. And they, his gang cloned cards, they stole details, they stole a fortune from cash machines. Now he was caught, he was grabbed because one day an FBI guy um, actually spotted him uh, acting suspiciously at an ATM, probably with a great big, you know, duffel bag or something, stuffing it full of cash as it was cashing out. And when they caught him and they realised what he had been doing, they said, "Look, hey," they said, "Look, look, look. Obviously, what you've been doing is a bit naughty, but do you want to work for us? Maybe you can give us some information." on other hacking gangs. And Gonzalez, who was looking at being locked up for years and years and years, the rest of his life maybe, said, yeah, I'll do that, of course I'll help you. But what he also did was he carried on hacking. And he carried on stealing tens of millions of credit card details. And so when you ask yourself, is this guy evil or a genius? I'd say, not a genius, not that smart. Because I mean, given, given that lifeline, he carried on hacking. Um, and uh, yeah, not good for him. Here's someone else. Does anyone recognize this lady? 
Her name is Kemi Badenoch. And in April of last year, the UK press obtained a video of her. Oh, I've realised I'm going to need some sound. Hang on. Let's plug that in. Have we got sound on this? Yes, but you have to say Okay, I think I've uh, I think I've done that. We'll we'll find out if it works or not. Kemi Badenoch, she was um, the press got hold of this video of her, and uh, she made a surprising confession. Let's take a look. What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? The naughtiest thing I about ten can you, years ago. Can you turn it up a bit? I Is that possible? Hacked into. Oh, hang on, there's a chap. Sorry, I should have done this in advance. <laughs> so she's been asked what the naughtiest thing is that she's ever done. Here we go. I think. Blink. What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? <laughs> the naughtiest thing. I, about ten years ago, I... I hacked into, oh my god, it's about, I uh, hacked into a Labour MP website. <laughs> <laughs> and I changed um, all the stuff in there to say nice things about Tories. That's nice. Funny. Yeah, but I wouldn't name who. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. She says that she admits a crime. And uh, I was interested. So this, this video appeared, thank you, there's no more sound, so I, I won't trouble you again, but thank you very much to our sound chap there for jumping in and rescuing everything. So it was interesting, when this video came out of this woman saying that she hacked into a Labour website about 10 years ago, I thought, I wonder what website that was. I wonder what happened. And so I did a little bit of searching around on the internet and I found this news story. Here it is from 2008. Someone hacked into the website of Labour Party deputy leader at the time, Harriet Harman. And they upped, she's obviously in Labour, and they updated her website to say that she had changed sides and she'd now decided to become a Tory and she was back in a chap, you may not have heard of him, called Boris Johnson, um, who was hoping to be London mayor. Now, you may think, well, that, that must be really clever to hack into. You have to be quite a genius to hack into a website. Not in the case of Harriet Harman's website. Um, because <laughs> turned out <laughs> her choice of username and password not that sophisticated and so that was Kemi Badenoch and the woman who targeted Harriet Harman's website I wonder what happened to Kemi Badenoch I wonder what she might be doing now oh She's a member of parliament for Saffron Walden, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Children and Families, and her boss is a person called... Well done. <laughs> Very good. Boris Johnson. Quite astonishing. So, some of the people we have representing us back in the UK um, have actually admitted quite openly doing hacking, hacking in, being juvenile, being untrustworthy. Who would have imagined that? Uh, that a politician could possibly do that. In a, to, you know, very graciously, Harriet Harman said, I don't really care about this, let's just move on, she's apologised. But if you ask yourself, is she an evil genius? I'd say, well, certainly not a genius. I don't think so. Didn't require that much sophistication. Someone else then. This chap is a chap called Michael Bowen. And Michael Bowen was based in the Philippines, and Michael Bowen was the best mate of someone else called O'Neill de Guzman. You may know O'Neill de Guzman, you may have received an email which he wrote. The email read, kindly read the attached love letter coming from me. And it spread on May the 4th, 2000. He was the author of the love bug worm, which forwarded itself to everybody in your address book. At the time, it was the biggest worm ever. This guy isn't the guy who wrote the love bug, this is his mate, O'Neill de Guzman. But he also was writing malware in the Philippines. And what he did was he wrote a piece of malware which did do something quite evil. In fact, so bad, so evil, that I'm not going to show you on the screen with Clippy. Because it did use Clippy, but in this case I'm actually going to replace it with the uh, Albert Einstein icon. It used Clippy to post up a random quote as it infected your Word documents. But it also took over your printers. And at the end of the month, his virus displayed a message saying, if I don't get a job by the end of this month, I'm going to release another virus which will 
what does it say? It will, it will uh, Parakona Ring Phenomat Ang Hard Disk Mo, which is Tagalog for I'm going to shag your hard drive. And so it'd wipe your hard drive. And he printed out this warning on your printers, and he said, if you don't give me a job. Now, how are we going to resolve this problem? Well, you see, Michael Bowen had had an idea. He didn't just print out that threat. He followed up that threat on his printer with a printout of his entire CV. Name, address, phone number. Genius? Genius? No, no, no. Let's take a look at this guy. I've had to pixelate out his eyes. I can't show you his true identity. This guy is a member of a gang called the Syrian Electronic Army. The Syrian Electronic Army were quite famous, like Lulsec, for hacking into media organizations. They're a pro-Assad hacking gang. Um, they were making menaces, but they were also breaking into organizations, stealing data, and rather like Brian was saying, hold and, holding those companies ransom and saying, unless you pay us money, we are going to release your data onto the internet. And that will be embarrassing to you. And I used to get emails from people like the Syrian Electronic Army myself saying, hey, we've hacked this organization. Here is some of the data we've stolen from them. Would you like to write about it because they won't pay the ransom? And I would say, no, I'm not going to be party to your extortion plot. Um, go to Vice or something like that and they'll see if they're right about it. Um, but it wasn't really my cup of tea. But they had a problem. They had a problem when they were extorting money. And the clue is in their name because they were the Syrian Electronic Army, which meant sanctions, which meant it wasn't easy to move money to Syria. Now, why they weren't using a cryptocurrency, I have no idea. But they were actually asking for cold, real money. Um, and they used to negotiate with the companies as to how to do that. And they would say, look, we realize because we're in Syria, it's hard to wire the money to us. But we have go-betweens. We have a go-between, for instance, in Germany who you can work with. And so they would say to these companies, look, if you send us so many thousand euros to our contact in Germany, here's his name. His name is Pierre Romar. He lives in the town of Walterhausen in the middle of Germany. Um, then you can, uh, we can do the deal. And they would even give the targeted company, the hacked company, Pierre's email address so they could make contact directly. Um, oh, I mean, obviously that must be a pseudonym, right? They, they wouldn't give his, he wouldn't use his real name in the email address which he's using for the extortion plot. Now, I don't know if any of you have worked for really large companies. I've worked for fairly large companies before. And one of the biggest obstacles to getting anything done I found in business is the legal department. Because I would want to do something in my department and legal or health and safety would say, you can't do that, Graham, because it's technically against the law or, you know, people will get killed or something like that. You know, whatever it is you're doing, it's too dangerous. And I say, oh, give me a break. Just let me do my job. No, 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 Graham, it's too dangerous. Well, similarly, if your company is ever blackmailed by cyber criminals, you may find it very frustrating that the legal department want to get involved. And that's what happened in this particular case. The legal department of this US company got involved and said, look, if we pay this money to our extortionist, where's the guarantee that they won't release our data? Which is quite a reasonable question to ask, you know, how, how can we be sure? And so the legal department said, why don't we write up a contract? So we will write up a contract, right? And we will send it to them saying, you agree, you know, once we've paid you this money that you will destroy all copies of the data and you will not release it everywhere. And they sent this to Pierre Romar, working for the Syrian Electronic Army. And they said, can you sign this? Name, address, scan of your passport. <laughs> and that's what he did. <laughs> Scanned in his passport. So if you're ever being extorted by someone, why not say, yes, yes, of course, we'd love to pay you. Our bloody legal department, however, demand that you fill in all this information for us. And they have to be thinking, oh, great, we're going to get some money. Yeah, we'll give them all that. You know, time for the police to come round. Uh, everything. So, um, yeah, it's not going to end well. Genius? Genius? Evil, maybe. A little bit evil. Genius? No, I would say not. And the thing is that greed doesn't discriminate, right? It catches out both the smart and the dumb. 
And when something like that, an opportunity for these hackers to make a quick buck comes along, common sense can just completely evaporate from their mind. You know, we're all stupid. We're all cavemen in many ways. This entire industry is based upon the fact that we haven't managed to roll out a patch for the human brain yet. It's because we keep on making the same mistakes. We keep on blundering in. Our mouse finger gets all twitchy at the thought of clicking on a, an image of Anna Kornikova or upstaged uh, myself. Jennifer Lopez, I'm still not doing any better. Whoever, I, I can't mention anyone current because I'm going to seem like a dirty old man now, aren't I? So I don't know. Um, let's just move on, move on, Graham. So crim- cyber criminals, are they evil geniuses? I'd say they're not all evil. Uh, and they're not all geniuses either. I think there's plenty of evidence that some of them aren't very smart. Some of them may just be misguided. Some of them may just be in desperate straits to make some cash, and this opportunity has arisen to them. And the power of the internet has given them this ability to cause all kinds of mischief. And they may not be either, actually. They may just be people who just need to be steered slightly in a different direction. I, I, I feel very uncomfortable with calling anybody truly evil other than Phil Collins and Clippy. Um, so good people sometimes will do very bad things, and sometimes bad people do dumb things as well. But maybe sometimes they'd just be in this other category, which is what I like to call wombats. And... Again, our industry is based upon the fact that we are all wombats. We get distracted, we get confused, we get flustered, we make mistakes. And so it's very easy for all of us to be in that category as well. So rather than splitting people up like this and assuming that every hacker out there is a criminal mastermind, when clearly, as we saw from Brian's presentation earlier, some of the techniques being used are not sophisticated. I mean, they're not sophisticated. They're not groundbreaking. And actually, maybe that is the clever thing. Maybe the clever thing is actually, you said they, you, they, you know, they were lazy, Brian. You know, it's not very smart. But I was thinking, well, actually, maybe it is smart to be lazy. Maybe if something is working, then the smart thing to do is just keep on doing it. Because why go to the extra effort of being more sophisticated? And many of these hackers, I find it difficult to put them in the evil or genius camp completely, but they certainly would appear in the wombat camp. And maybe that's where they should be instead. I hope that's been interesting to you. Thank you very much. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I mean, what questions could you possibly have? Or uh, any points? Normally, when you ask people for questions, they actually say, I don't have a question. I just have a statement which I wish to make, uh, demonstrating how clever I am. And uh, yes, I thought you looked like the kind of person. Yes. What are you talking about on the podcast? What we're talking about? Oh, excellent. Well, far, far be it for me to plug something up on stage here at IrisCon. Um, we, what we talk about on the podcast is about the quirky stories which have happened in the last week, what we try and do is we make the, uh, the subject of computer security accessible to everyone. Because I think there's a problem whereby there's too many nerds speaking to other nerds. I think there's a problem whereby some security podcasts are quite exclusive and they've got great technical content. And if you want to get into the interrupt vector registers and if you want to get into the registry keys, they're smashing. But We need to get the general public interested in online privacy and securing their devices and things like that. So we're just trying to do it in an accessible way. And normally it's a load of old rubbish, to be honest. But it comes out every week. Um, Does anyone listen to Smashing Security? You've got very handsome guests. Very handsome guests, like Brian Honan (laughs) as well. (laughs) Oh, suddenly no one's interested, Brian. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) Any, Any other questions? When you sound like Sammy Cantor or Jake Davis, who did bad things and then went good, but when you sound evil genius, like that. it's difficult, isn't it? I have to admit, I think ra- rather like the situation we have in the news at the moment, right, where there's a very high-profile individual who didn't properly express remorse. It's hard for observers to move on. I think I have a problem with that. I have a problem when people have done something bad. If I don't really feel that they're sorry about what they did, then I find it difficult to sort of embrace them myself. And that has been true of some notorious hackers in the past 
who've done things and have made a name for themselves and then end up on the speaking circuit or whatever. And they may be great speakers, but I just want them to say, you know what? I was a bloody idiot and you shouldn't do what I did rather than sort of reveling in the notoriety. And some people haven't done that. Some people have been very good about moving on. I was at an event uh, just a couple of weeks ago and one of the speakers was a, uh, a former member of Anonymous who did some naughty stuff. And I, d- I listened to his talk and I thought, you're not really sorry about this. You got caught by the FBI. You're sorry about getting caught by the FBI, but you still kind of think what you did was cool, and it wasn't cool, because all of us use the internet, and little old ladies use the internet to keep in touch with their grandchildren on the other side of the world, and you've made the internet less of a comforting and embracing thing for the general public. So I certainly believe that everyone can be rehabilitated and, and can be brought back. Um, but I do want to genuinely feel that they think what they did in the past was wrong and do something to ensure that other people don't follow too strongly in their footsteps. It, what annoys me is there are people who sometimes do things which aren't terribly sophisticated, not terribly clever, and are heralded by the media as being genius hackers. And yet what they proved was that they were ethically immature and childish and maybe malicious. And there are plenty of good guys and girls in this industry who, when they were teenagers, decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hack into someone's account. I'm not going to make someone's life a misery. I'm not going to mean that these IT guys have to work overtime fixing a problem or fixing a website, and they miss their daughter's birthdays or whatever because of my immaturity. And I think those are the people who should be heralded and applauded, but often they're the ones who don't make a name for themselves. I've got one fan. Yes. So, yeah, remember the, um, the MD that you were just talking about? Yes. Uh, she hacks one of the labor yep. MD's websites and did it 10 years later. So, like, what's your position on people like that that basically never get charged for what is technically a crime, right? I mean, because under the CFA, she could have committed a crime. Yeah. She committed a crime, and what we've got there is video of her 10 years later as an MP laughing about it, thinking it's funny. I think it's not a great role model, is it? But frankly, what great role models do we have in politics right now? Um, there's, you know, there's a few, there's a few wrong ones out there at the moment. So, uh, yeah, it, it makes me uncomfortable. I don't know if it's really in the public interest to pursue a case like that. And it doesn't appear that anyone has actually, you know, Harriet Harman clearly doesn't want to pursue it either. It's been a long time and maybe no real damage has been done in retrospect. But, um, it doesn't, give a great role model uh, for children, does it? Who might be tempted to do other things. Just like other things. Not just cybercrime and hacking. Many people would argue, for instance, the US president at the moment is not a great role model for children. He's a great model for four-year-olds who want to become five-year-olds, but uh, not a great role model for people who want to be adults one day. Any other questions? Yes, chap over here. On the opposite scale to what you've just been talking about, in terms of the triviality of at what point or what level of incident needs to occur for a nation state to go to war with another one of the Chinese or Vietnam belts? Yeah, I mean. It, 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 the Chinese, the Chinese know the Where's the breaking point? I, I don't know where the breaking point, other than it's probably broken. Um, it's probably something which is really quite fragile. I mean, there is this huge danger that when a hack occurs, fingers begin to get pointed, and it's obviously very, very difficult to reliably attribute where an attack might have come from. And there's a tendency, particularly amongst the media, not to get want to get into that kind of detail and the granularity, because it becomes a more complicated story. We saw in the UK just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Labour Party, their website suffered a DDoS, and it was presented as a highly sophisticated cyber attack. Now, us in this room know a, whoopsie, know a DDoS is not a highly sophisticated cyber attack. But to the general public, that sounds really scary. And you begin to think, oh, could it be the Russians? Could it be the Conservatives? Could it be Boris, you know, hitting refresh on his browser multiple times? You know, what, what could be happening, you know, because of that? And, and maybe, I don't know why they said that. Maybe they said that because they're not very technical themselves. Maybe they were advised that. Maybe because they thought it would be embarrassing to say we were affected by a really trivial juvenile cyber attack, which any 13-year-old could have pulled off. Hard to say. Yes, question in the middle. 
I beg your pardon? <laughs> Could it have been Kemi Badnock? Oh, who did it? Oh, who did the DDoS? Well, maybe, you know. I guess they've all got a few weeks off at the moment, aren't they? And they're, they're not very busy uh, until the election comes around. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure uh, to come to my first IrisCon, and I hope you have a terrific rest of the day. If you want to grab me during one of the breaks, I will have some stickers available. Woo! Thank you.